Welcome to Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful you've decided to be here with us, and we hope you'll be encouraged as you participate in today's service. So join with us now as Pastor Robbie Hendrick leads us in worship of the one true and living God. Well, welcome to the evening service at Christ Church Presbyterian. Welcome to our members and any visitors that we might have. It's good to see everybody's smiling face, even those that are behind the mask. So we, uh, we welcome you. The announcements are in the bulletin. Uh, I think Robbie went over them this morning. Just a few things to mention. Uh, Wednesday night, if you get a chance, come. Uh, even I come and I'm, I wear a mask about 90% of the time, but um, it's good, and, and Robbie is enlightening us on creation. So it ought to be a very interesting, uh, it ought to be a very interesting series. So come if you can on Wednesday night. Multiple Bible studies, they're all in the bulletin. Uh, give them a look and pick one. The Fall Festival on the 28th. Um, that looks like it'd be fun for the young and those that are young in heart. And I can't wait to see Robbie in the dunking booth. Um, don't forget to sign the, re the friendship register. And if you see somebody on your row that you don't know or somebody across the aisle that you don't know, go and, and meet them and greet them. We need to dispel this myth that Presbyterians are the frozen chosen. Okay. All right. Call to worship comes from Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. I give you thanks, O Lord with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come this evening to worship you, to glorify and honor you. Speak to us as we read, pray, sing, and preach your word. Help us to clear our minds of the things of this world. May the Holy Spirit indwell us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your family song collection, number 54, as we sing together, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Let's stand to sing.
Let us go to prayer. Our Lord, we come into the throne room this evening through the blood of Christ. We come to praise your name, to acknowledge that you are omnipotent, almighty, all-powerful, all-holy, infinite, and immutable. As mortals, we cannot grasp your greatness. We come with humility and contrite hearts. You are a loving but a just God. We are saved from your justice only by the sacrifice of Christ. We come before you wrapped in his righteousness, not our rags. We come asking forgiveness for our sins. We are proud and selfish people. We are too focused on the things of this world. We are anxious about many things, including the pandemic, the elections, the chaos in our streets. Help us to focus more on you and how we can serve you and our fellow man. Help us to remember that you are sovereign. Give us your peace, which surpasses all understanding, and guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your many gifts to us, faith, family, friends. We thank you for your son, for his church, for our freedoms, and for our worldly goods. We have many supplications. Forgive our sins, which are many. Grow our faith and our love for you. Guide our walks and make our paths straight. Protect and grow your church universal and this church and other Bible-believing churches in our community. We pray for our building program. We pray for our staff. Protect them from the evil one. We pray for our missionaries here and abroad. We pray especially for Carl and Debbie Dushbach in Kenya. We pray for our country. We pray for the upcoming elections. I pray that we will vote our faith. Please, Lord, do not turn your face from us, even though as a nation we deserve your wrath for our many sins. We pray for our leaders at all levels of government. May they look to you and may you give them wisdom. We pray for our military, our police, our first responders, protect and sustain them. We pray for our congregation. Where there is sickness, give health. Where there is strife, give forgiveness and peace. Where there is fear and sadness, give hope and comfort. And where there is loss, give a sense of your presence. We pray for an end to the pandemic here and throughout the world. We pray that you will protect us and our loved ones. We pray as always that we will abhor evil, cling to what is good, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, steadfast in prayer, and given to hospitality. Lord, may we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you this day and all the days of our lives. May Christ be in us and we in him, and may the God of peace be with us always. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Tell you a little story. We, way back in, I think it was 1996, maybe, I think that was the year we took a, I was a youth director, it was a different life, and we took about 40 plus children to Jamaica on a missions trip. And one of them was to do concerts. Uh, we did 32 concerts in 16 days. None of us had a voice. But that song was one of the songs that we sang. And so when I came in and heard them practicing, it just really, uh, it really touched my heart. Uh, how blessed we are to be able to hear this, the truth of God generation after generation. You're talking one, maybe even two generations now as I get older. Uh, removed, and uh, the truth of the of the scriptures continue to to permeate out, and how how blessed we are to see that with our with our young people. I almost said children, but they're not really children, are they? They're growing, and uh, so uh, it just warmed my heart. It was a great thing to hear, great thing to see. Thank you guys for leading us in worship in that. Uh, Galatians chapter three is where we are. We're going to be looking at verses nineteen to twenty five. Let me give you a little bit of a background because. Uh, repetition does breed learning, and now we're covered in the same thing for about the fourth week in a row, so hopefully uh, we're beginning to pick it up. We've been fighting really alongside Paul against the Judaizers. Remember that Paul came in and planted a bunch of churches on his first missionary journey. Uh, the Judaizers came back in and said, listen, what Paul said is fine, but it's not grace alone. You must also keep the law. And if you want to be a believer, if you want to believe in God, uh, then you must not just have grace, but you must also be circumcised and become Jewish. And so that's been the fight. That's the whole reason that Galatians, the book of Galatians has been written. Their idea uh, was grace plus keep the law. Of course, Paul came back through in his second missionary journey and said, everything those people said is not true. Uh, you do not have to keep the law in order to be saved. Uh, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And yes, the word alone, and I say this all the time, is very important. And now you're beginning to see why. Uh, because they kept adding things to it. Now, the question that really popped up is how can anyone be justified before God? And these are the two questions that are popped up all the time. How uh, it, can you be justified before God? And then how does that justification happen? And so, once again, I've given you, I think, in your bulletin, uh, question 33 out of the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, Shorter Catechism, which says, what is justification? So let me read it again. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all of our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. So this really is kind of a legal term where we have two columns. One is in the red and one is in the black, and we're the ones that's living in the red. And God imputes his righteousness, which creates the black in our life, uh, so that we are now at least been, our sins have been paid for. And it's this beautiful, beautiful picture. Now, up to now, Paul has argued with them according to their own experience. And this was really starting in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And he begins to push on them uh, their own experience about how they became uh, Christians. And then he turns around in chapters 3, verses 6 through 14, he begins to argue their heritage. Of course, we talked about how Abraham is a very prominent figure in their life, and they always attach themselves to Abraham, and those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And he begins to say, listen, at the end of the day, you claim Abraham is your father because you're doing what Abraham did. I claim Abraham is my father because I believe what Abraham believed. And that was the difference in the two. And so chapter 3, verse 11, he even says, the righteous shall live by faith. And we, of course, know that that was Martin Luther's famous conversion scripture as he is climbing up the steps with bloody knees and it begins to hit him that the righteous shall live by faith. I'll tell that story at some point in time. Uh, I don't know. We're only a couple of weeks away from uh, the fall festival and the idea of October the 31st being Reformation Day. I may even say it then. Just a little heads up. In chapter 3, verses 15 to 18, Paul then argued from the human example of a covenant, uh, really arguing from the lesser to the greater. We know that a covenant is one-sided, and it is a bond that is in blood and sovereignly administered, basically saying that the inheritance is based solely on the one giving. 
not the one receiving. And it is God who gives, and it's permanent, and it's a promise, and it's to a particular person. And so we now come to the question, well, if all of this is true, and all we need is grace to be a Christian, if we receive God's grace and we don't have to worry about the law, then why is the law given? Now, we touched on this last week. We're going to dig into it a little bit more this week. If everything is true that Paul has been arguing in Galatians chapter 3, then why do we have the law? What is the purpose of the law? And last week, we took a small look. We said that the law is a mirror teaching us our total depravity, that everything that we do has a tint of blue in it if sin is blue, thought, word, and deed. We also know that the law is a curb keeping us from being as bad as we could be, and that the law is also a map or a guide teaching us what God requires and informing us of his will for us. But we need to dig a little deeper in this well if we're going to understand it completely. That's our goal tonight. You with me? All right. We are seeing... Oh, no. All right. Galatians 3, starting with verse 19. Hear the inerrant and infallible word of God. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Let's pray. Father, we are forever grateful for your love for us. Lord, we're thankful even for the gift of music and how we can express our love for you in music. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray that even tonight, you would continue to reveal yourself to us. Lord, that you would draw our hearts closer to you as we seek to do your will. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I am a huge baseball fan. All of my children, and my daughter played softball, but all of my children, my boys at some point played uh, baseball. Uh, My oldest son played baseball in college. We did the circuit for a long time. In fact, at one point, he was an Under Armour All-American in high school, went to Tucson, Arizona, actually twice to play in an Under Armour All-American tournament. I love the idea of the strategies of baseball. I love the Braves. In fact, I'm thankful they came on late tonight because I still wanted to come and preach. Uh, So I'm thankful that they're coming on later. Um, But I also know that there was a moment in baseball time when the perfect story of the Reformation was exposed. You see, for two glorious summers, the Chicago Cubs taught baseball fans the fundamentals of Reformation theology. It was, see, you're looking at me like, huh? Back in 1988, the Cubs made a trade for a man named Vance Law, and they put him at third base. Then a few months later, marvelous to say, they brought up a man from the AAA whose name was Mark Grace, and they put him at first base. There they were, law at third, grace at first, law and grace on the same field, on the same team, helping one another to accomplish the same goal. 
They were even in the proper batting order. Grace batted first. Then right behind him was law. God gave grace to Abraham before he gave Moses the law. There they stood on the diamond, grace and law, holding down the opposite corners of the infield. And opposing batters would get up and hit a ball to law. And the only way he could get him out was to throw it to grace. It was for two summers the perfect picture of Reformed theology. Law and grace are not opponents. They are teammates working together. But we must understand how they work together. We're going to keep digging in to last week's idea of what the law was given to us for. All right, Roman numeral number one. What does the law do? The law reveals sin. Look at verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Now, what's important about this is we need to understand that because it was added because of sin, that at some level the law was preventative. Because the law has consequences to it, it has some ability to control transgressions. Think about this. Why is it that I choose to not steal? I'm afraid I'm going to get in trouble. I'm afraid I'm going to be arrested. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my good name. I'm afraid I'm going to go to jail. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. I mean, there are a lot of consequences to sin. And the law shows the difference between right and wrong, and it shows how wrongdoers ought to be punished. And the fear of that punishment helps to restrain evil. John Calvin really calls this the second use of the law. This is part of the curb that I've been talking about last week and now this week. Sometimes, however, in fact, I would think most of the time, the complete opposite is true. The law reveals sin not in a way that it's preventative. It keeps us from sinning worse than we could be. But it's also provocative. I mean, let's face it. In our lives, when we see the law, there is something. Now, we know that it's sin. But there is something inside of us that just wants to say no to the rules. We literally want to break the law when we see it. I've been on a lot of college campuses in my day, and just about everyone that I've been on, I have looked specifically for this one sign. On every college campus, somewhere in the grassy, beautiful area, there is this sign that simply says, do not walk on the grass. And right beside that sign is a trail of dirt that goes to the closest point. Because every single person that walks by looks at that sign and thinks, I'm going this way. And they have beat down the grass to be nothing more than a dirt trail. There is something inside of us when we see something like that. Speed limit 55. Come on, who decided that? I know I can go faster than that. There's something inside of us that wants to break the law. And what the law does is it exposes that in us. The law has a way of making people want to break it. You know, another way of actually translating verse 19, the law was given, and I put this in quotes, in order that there might be transgressions. Some translations of the Bible actually have that. The law was given or added so that there might be transgressions. In other words, it exposes people's hearts to say that they want to break the law. Now, law, you know I'm talking about God's law. God did not give the law to Moses just to decrease sin or to decrease transgression. Sometimes it actually increases sin and increases transgressions. The law exposes sin for what it really is, a violation of God's holy standard. 
The law of God actually provokes people to sin. It makes a bad situation even worse many times. God did not give the law to reveal the way to be justified. He gave it to disclose the evil power of sin. This is the rule and realm you're living under. Martin Luther wrote, The true function and the chief and proper use of the law is to reveal to man his sin, his blindness, his misery, his wickedness, his ignorance, and his hate and contempt of God. Death, hell, judgment, and the well-deserved wrath of God. Yet this is still a good thing. Now, the Bible uses the word added. It was added because of transgression, which is implying to us that it kind of came in from a side road. It kind of merged as we were running down the road. It's kind of an on-ramp to the gospel highway. The law was given, wrote John Calvin, in order to make transgressions obvious and in this way to compel men to acknowledge their guilt. Don't we want this as parents? Don't we want our children to acknowledge their own guilt without us having to tell it to them all the time? We want them to obviously see the sin in their life and in their heart. We want them to acknowledge their guilt. We want them to repent on their own God wants the same from us. And it's important for us to understand that when it says that it was added, it kind of came in on a highway that we were already on. So all of that really is number one. The law reveals sin. Number two, the law also has limits. Calvin called the law's ability to reveal the sin the first use of the law. We know that it's the second use is to restrain evil. That's the curb. There is also a third use of the law, and Paul will introduce this later in chapter 5 where the law shows the Christian how to live for Christ, but the law does have its limits here in the passage. And the first is that the law is temporary. Now look, don't shut down on me because we already know the passage says every jot and tittle is going to make it eternally. We know that, but let me explain what I mean when I say that the law is temporary. The very first use of the law is temporary, the law that reveals sin. How do I know that? Because when we get to heaven, there is no sin. The law reveals sin for only a certain period of time. We know that God's law is eternal, but the specific administration of the law given to Moses with all of its ceremonies and all of its curses and all of its sacrifices had its limits. It was fulfilled completely when the offspring, that is the Lord Jesus, came. So we know at some level the law is temporary. We also know that it's secondary. Chapter 319, it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Phrases like this should jump out at us when we read the Bible. The law was given through angels. What does that mean? It's difficult to know precisely what this means or quite how it fits into Paul's argument, but angels are not specifically mentioned in Exodus 19, when God gave the law. God gave the law to Moses, and the Bible says a thick cloud with thunder and lightning and fire and smoke and earthquakes and trumpets. It was all there. And Moses doesn't talk about angels that were there until later in his life, right before he dies. Moses does mention angels in Deuteronomy 33. Here's what Deuteronomy 33, 2 says. The Lord came from Sinai, and dawned from Sierra upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. There it is. David actually sang in Psalm 68, The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. Not only were the angels with God when he gave the law, but the law was actually given through them. Now think about how important this is. The law came through an intermediary of angels, but grace came how? Directly from God. So we begin to see the relationship. Acts chapter 7, verse 53, when Stephen preached the gospel to the Jewish leaders, he said that the law was delivered by angels. 
In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, it says the message was declared by angels. Not only was it given by angels, it was also given by, the Bible says, an intermediary. This is 319. Law came to God's people indirectly through angels and by a mediator, meaning Moses. Think about this. The promise, the covenant promise, did not have a mediator. God gave it immediately to Abraham on the basis of his own eternal immutable will. There was no intermediary except for the Lord Jesus, who is God. It was direct. The promise of the covenant came to Abraham firsthand from God, and the law came to the people really thirdhand. God, the angels, Moses to the people. The law had a limited function for a limited time. It had a limited function for a limited time. And unlike the promise, it was delivered by angels, which made it secondary. And since eventually it gave way to the promise, it was only temporary. doesn't mean it's going away. It means it's going to be completely fulfilled. All right? One and two. Number three. Y'all still with me? A non Tired head nod would be good here. All right, number three. The law actually endorses a Savior. What is the purpose of the law? It, it points us to or endorses a Savior. Uh, chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? No, not contrary, but complementary. The reason that the law was not at odds with the promise is that it had a totally different purpose the reason that law and grace can be on the same field is because they had different objects, different things they were supposed to do with the same goal in mind. And unlike the promise, the law does not give life. But it does endorse life through someone else. Somebody hits the ball to law at third base. In order to get him out, he has to throw it to grace. It's as simple as that. You see, Paul sets out in verse 19 to explain the purpose of the law, and he goes 19, 20, and 21, and 22, and by the time we get to 22, we still have not heard what the purpose of the law is. He keeps rambling about other things. And so far, Paul has said more about what the law cannot do than what it can do. It cannot give life. All it can do is reveal sin. It does not come straight from God. It is mediated by angels. It's not quote-unquote, lasting forever in its ability to guide us and tell us what to do. It lasted only until the coming of Christ, and then it was fulfilled. Yet even in this apparent failure of the law, it, does, it is doing God's work. Because it's not temporary as temporary as much as it is preparatory. It is preparing us to hear about grace. It was leading the way for something or someone greater. Look at verse 22. The scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. By revealing our sin, the law performs a public service for us and proves that it still has a valuable place in the plan of salvation because all it does is push us toward a Savior. By showing us that it cannot save, the law helps us to look for someone who can. And when the world starts looking for a way out of sin, it discovers that God's mercy is the only escape. Think about this. What do we do in the world today, the non-Christian world, when, to deal with sin? We have to declare there's no such thing as sin. And yet we know that's not true. But if we can convince each other, including myself, that there's no such thing as sin, then I don't have to worry about being saved from sin. But our conscience tells us something differently. And it's a way for us, even God leading our conscience, to tell us that we need a Savior. Look, in reality, the law with all of its functions does contribute to justification because it doesn't justify, 
but it impels us to the promise of grace and makes it sweeter and more desirable. Martin Luther says it this way, we do not abolish the law, but we show its true function and its use, impelling us to Christ, for its function and use is not only to disclose the sin, but also the wrath of God. And it drives us to Christ. Therefore, the principal purpose of the law in theology is to make men not better, but worse. Listen carefully. What's the greatest use of the law? To show us how bad we are. Why is that important? To show us that we need a Savior. What's so great about that? We have a Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. The law shows us our sin. And by that recognition of sin, we may be humbled. We may be frightened. We may even be worn down. And that's what drives us for our longing for grace and the blessed offspring that God himself gave us through his son. Rather than contradicting the promise of God for a Messiah, it is actually endorsing the Messiah by continually driving us to him. Number four, and I think I'm done. The law also protects It's crazy to think this way, but hang in there with me for just a minute. Paul concludes his argument with two illustrations that show how the law protects us as it pushes us or leads us to Christ. And the first picture that we see is a prison. Look with me at verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law imprisoned, there's the word, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. The law is a prison warden whose job it is to keep us locked up in sin's penitentiary. Now, our first thought is, well, that's not good. But think about it. What is the purpose of a penitentiary? The very word penitentiary comes from the word penitent, which means to repent, What is the purpose of a penitentiary? To make us think about what we've done. To drive us to repentance. And while we are thinking about those things, we are in a cell kept safe. We think that this idea of being imprisoned is a bad thing, yet at some level it is a good thing because we are protected. The law kept the Jews under protective custody Until Jesus came. The law really is a guardian. A protector. Refusing to let go until it hands us directly over to Christ. In the baseball illustration, we're really the ball. We're the ball that gets hit to third and law picks it up. And throws it. To grace. The second picture that we see is of a pedagogue. Look with me at verse 24 and 25. So then the law was our guardian, there's the word guardian, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are not longer a guardian. We are no longer a guardian. The word guardian here is literally the word pedagogue. Now, what is a pedagogue? It's a slave that is appointed to serve as a child's protector. In wealthy Greek families, children were individually raised by pedagogues. From age six until late adolescence, the child was under constant care and constant supervision by this slave that was called a pedagogue. Really a part-time babysitter and part-time chaperone, uh, and really part probation officer. Ancient drawings usually depict this pedagogue holding a rod in their hand as they're standing next to the child, ready to administer corporal punishment when needed. They helped to feed and dress the child and to carry the child's educational tools. 
Now, listen, the pedagogue was not a teacher. He or she was the disciplinarian. They served the best interest of the child in many ways, and a close bond of affection often developed between the two. Discipline was not necessarily severe, and the pedagogue provided protection as well as punishment as the child grew. Paul is saying that the law is like a pedagogue. And like a pedagogue, the law eventually works its way out of a job. Because when the child comes of age, it no longer needs constant supervision. And the law was only needed until Christ came. All of the language that we see in the Bible where Christ is talking about the law of love, love your neighbor as yourself, it, it, it gets rid of all of the law. Let me give you an example of this. That I use this illustration a lot, and I always ask the question. You go into a grocery store, you know the candy bars are this high off the shelf, and they're there for a reason, so all your children will want one. But at the end of the day, if you're by yourself, why do you not steal one? Why do you just not take it? It's, how easy is it to take it, slip it in your pocket, you go out the door, no one's the wiser. Well, you think about all the things that I talked about earlier. You say to yourself, well, if I get caught, I'll get in trouble. I'll get arrested. I'll lose my job. I'll lose. Okay, that's the law coming into play. Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law. So maybe there's a bigger and a better reason to not steal a candy bar. And maybe it's this. Jesus loves me so much that he died for me. And I love him so much, I only want to do what he has called me to do. And he has asked me to not steal. Therefore, I'm not going to steal this candy bar because I know that Jesus loves me and I want to love him in return. And the best way to love him in return is to not steal. That's how I love him in return. That's the law of love. You see, when we begin to live that way, when we begin to understand that that is the law of love in the life of Jesus Christ and how we relate to him, the civil laws take care of themselves. We don't have to worry about stealing anymore. We don't have to worry about all of the things that so many other people have to worry about who are constantly battling the consequence of sin and I'm going to be arrested and how things go. No, we don't worry about those things because we have a different law, the law of love that says, I love Jesus and this is why I want to do this out of my love for him. We start making decisions based upon that. The law has fulfilled its purpose, and it no longer has a grip on us anymore. God has asked me to love my neighbor. That's what I'm going to do. God has asked me to encourage another. That's what I'm going to do. God has asked me at some level to turn the other cheek. That's what I'm going to do. God has asked me to share the message with those I come in contact with, and that's what I'm going to do. Why? Because I love him in return, because he has loved me. And the decisions that I make are coming out of that love. And then the civil law just begins to take a back seat. We don't worry about those things anymore. That's what Paul's trying to say here in this passage. The pedagogue had a job for a season, but once the child got old enough, the pedagogue was gone. Once we come to Christ, what we're really saying is that the civil law doesn't mean a whole lot to us. We should be following the moral law. If we follow the moral law of God in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and Exodus chapter 20, then the civil law will take care of itself. And these two illustrations, the prison holding us captive until Christ comes, and the pedagogue who at some point decides they don't need a job anymore because the child is old enough to know better now, these two illustrations, the prison and the pedagogue, show that the law had the legitimate purpose of keeping us safe until Christ came to save us. But when he did come to save us, the law now is set aside. Our decisions are made based upon our love for Christ. And when we read the Bible and Jesus asks us to do something, we do it out of our love for Christ. God used the law to shut us up in prison until Christ should set, should set us free. Or to put us under tutors until Christ should make us sons. 
All right. I kind of got on my soapbox there, but let me give you a couple of takeaways and I'm done. You still with me? Number one, when all, fails, when all else fails, just know that the law by itself cannot save. But it can lead to a Savior, or it can lead us into more sin. I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. You cannot see the law of God and remain where you are. It will either drive you to Christ or drive you away from Christ. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, When we read the scriptures, what is it doing? Is it drawing me to him? Or do I find my hardened heart being pushed away from him? Each reveals the condition of our heart, either being drawn or walking away. And we must know the consequence of both of these decisions. One, of course, is eternal life and blessing. The other is judgment and wrath. And it's about that simple. Number two, the only way the law will move us in any direction is if we know it. We must study it. We must study the scriptures. This is why the church must call sin, sin, so that we know what it is, whatever the sin may be. People obviously do not want to hear this, of course. The real issue is that sinners do not want to be judged for their sin, but the truth is we will be. Unless we come to faith in Christ, then we know our sin has been forgiven. Jesus has paid the price on our behalf. When that happens, the law takes on a completely different meaning for us now. Number three, and I think I'm done. The law does have a purpose. And we talked about this last week. We've talked about it again today. It's a mirror that reveals our sin. It's a curb that keeps us from being as bad as we could be. And it's a map and a guide to tell us and to show us the will of God in our life. But the most important thing we need to know is that the law's purpose is really to drive us to grace. Law and grace holding down the corners of the infield. John Stott says it this way, not until the law has arrested and imprisoned us will we pine for Christ to set us free. Not until the law has condemned and killed us will we call upon Christ for justification and life. Not until the law has driven us to despair of ourselves will we ever believe in Jesus. Not until the law has humbled us, even to hell, will we turn to the gospel to raise us to heaven. Law does not save us. Grace does. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, so that no man may boast. The law is good for a lot of things. Grace is good for the most important thing, and that is eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word, thankful for uh, Galatians and how Paul is continuing to argue and to continue to give us the truth about grace and law and the relationship between the two. Father, we fall so quickly into the idea of doing something to earn your merit. Father, we know, we know that with obedience comes blessing. We also know that with disobedience comes chastisement. But Lord, let that not be the driving force as to why we choose to do what we do. May we do what we do out of our love for you, because you loved us first. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our family songs collection as we close out the service. Number 78, number 78. Let's stand and sing together.
And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thanks for joining us for Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful that you were able to take part in worship with us, and we hope that the time you've spent here has been an encouragement to you. Please remember to stay in touch, and if there's something you need or something you'd like for us to lift up in prayer, call us at 706-210-9090. Of course, please continue to pray for each other and for those who lead us that they would seek God in their decisions. And don't forget to come back again to our website, myccp.faith, or the Christ Church Facebook page to be a part of worship at Christ Church Presbyterian.